So I suggest we get underway, Sophie, as people are tricking back in. So we have talked about all those different dimensions of power, the EU's reckoning with power throughout our discussions today. And one thing that has been central is the sort of work that is done by the European Policy Centre, by think tanks, by civil society, in terms of responding to this perma crisis. So in this last panel session, before we hear from Franz Timmermans later on, we want to focus on the role of civil society in the perma crisis. And the question we are asking is, what influence on policy making? And for this, I am delighted to hand over to Sophie Pornschlegel, who is an EPC senior policy analyst, and she's the Connecting Europe project leader. And I'll let you introduce your wonderful panel. Over to you, Sophie. Thank you very much. Does this? Yes, it does work. Thanks for being here. Um, I know you had a long day, so we'll try to keep it short and sweet. Um, and I'm very happy to introduce this and to moderate this panel. Um, as mentioned, I'm a senior policy analyst and I work on a project with Stiftung Mercator, which connects civil society organizations with EU decision makers. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, the perfect topic as well to introduce um, this session on the role of civil society in the perma crisis and what influence it has on EU policy making. And I, two points to say. The first one is we often talk about the EU power, but we never ask ourselves why. And I think this is the most important question is that of course it should benefit citizens and also civil society. And the second part is that we often talk about political power and economic power, but not so much about the power of civil society, even though we know very well that for instance, the yellow vest do, do have an impact and Fridays for Future also has an impact. So it's it's a very important power that we also need to keep in mind when we discuss um, the EU power as such. And to discuss that, I have a great panel with me uh, and I'll start with Emilia Rai, who is a European ombudsman. Uh, hopefully you know her. Uh, she does very important work when it comes to transparency and accountability in the EU. We have Catherine Kluber Ashberg, who is Executive Vice President of Bertelsmann Foundation, but also, as you mentioned, Senior Advisor for Europe's Future Programme at Bertelsmann. And last but not least, uh, Daniel Eriksson, uh, who is the Managing Director of Transparency International, who you hopefully also very know because transparency is quite, a, quite an important topic. And I'll start off uh, with my first question, and it goes to you, Emily Rai. What role do you see for civil society in the EU? And in particular, do you see a change since the 24th of February, um, knowing that we have a perma crisis, that you know, it has become very difficult to kind of solve the issues that we have? And do you see a shift on how the EU is handling civil society and what role it should take? Yeah, I... Is this so okay at home, is it? Yeah, okay. Uh, handling civil societies is an interesting uh, way of putting of it. Putting it. Uh, and, and sometimes you feel that the uh, the EU administration is trying to handle civil society or handle citizens. And I don't think that's the right verb that should be used. I understand why you're, you're saying it, but the citizens are why the administration exists. Um, it's as simple as that. Um, and everything that the administration does should be directed towards uh, the citizens. The first job of a government, the most important job is to protect its citizens. Uh, and that's what the role of the EU administration should be. Um, in my office as European Ombudsman, we handle complaints, we do strategic investigations into issues of, of public interest. And we rely on civil society actors, be they citizens, be they NGOs, be they media, to come to us and share with us their concerns and ask us if we can do anything to uh, to to assist them in what they're trying to do. I mean, uh, yeah, we are, the EU is a very strong democracy and the EU administration does many wonderful things and I will acknowledge that. Uh, and certainly it has done many excellent things throughout all of the crises that, that we've mentioned and made, made, made good decisions. But in order to be a fully, truly living, breathing, concrete democracy, there has to be a level playing field between citizens and the administration. And it's not a question of handling the citizens. It's a question of serving them and serving them appropriately. And I, I've just, I'm not going to, I know you, I think we just have a few minutes for this. So uh, before I came here and I was thinking about, I like to sort of do a show and tell rather than talk in abstract terms about, uh, about the work. So I, I, wrote down a few of the cases that, that we've been dealing with recently 
the transparency of the uh, of the recovery funds uh, in relation to Sweden and Denmark, particularly a case we just finished today, when the Commission was reluctant to make certain documents transparent in case it damaged the financial and economic interests of Sweden and Denmark. And when the journalist who asked for those documents went to Sweden and Denmark, they said, okay, fine. So they had no problems. There were no concerns in relation to any damage that would be done uh, to their particular interests. So the question is, well, then why, why was that not made transparent by the Commission itself? I've also written down revolving doors, Russia, fuel crisis, because... I think when the history of the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine is written and the fuel crisis that emerged out of that, uh, part of that story will be about revolving doors and the enabling of, uh, of, of Russia and its subsequent capacity to control uh, the fuel crisis was done by yeah, politicians, administrators, uh, enabling them and uh, enabled in turn by weak revolving doors rules. So th those are issues we deal with as well. The pandemic, we looked at the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control and how that had very deliberately been set up as a weak agency, although branded as a strong agency. And when push came to shove and the, when, the, when the pandemic actually happened, they were not able initially anyway to deal with it. And their panicked response at the beginning was, no, everything will be fine, we can cope with this. Now, that wasn't their fault. It was, you know, the legislators who set it up as it was. I've also scribbled down text messages, and that was the issue around text messages that were exchanged between the president of the commission and the head of the Pfizer company, uh, Mr. Bourla, uh, when negotiations for the vaccines were taking place. I mean, I think we're all very grateful that the vaccines uh, were gotten. There was a very panicked situation at the time, but there still has to be accountability. Uh, in, in relation to those contracts. And failing to be accountable gives rise to suspicion and allows people who are sceptical about Europe or who are anti-vax to have a space. And that's what's problematic. Uh, sustainability, uh, we did an investigation into the failure to do a sustainability impact assessment um, uh, in relation to the EU-Mercosur deal. Uh, and obviously the whole issue of, of climate change, environmental protection is also very important. So those are the issues that, that we deal with, but not when we're handling citizens, but when we're trying to amplify their voice and make sure that the uh, administration listens to them and uh, heeds their concerns. Thank you so much. And I'm glad I gave you some ground to, to make your points on. I think it's quite interesting because this was showcases maybe also the, the kind of confrontative, um, yeah, relation there is between institutions and civil society when maybe they should work together in, in a more, you know, cooperative manner. But now on to you, Catherine. Um, you work at Bertelsmann, which is a foundation and a think tank. And often, I mean, maybe you saw it as a Jubilee paper, think tanks are also part of civil society. They do play an important role to give policy advice to decision makers. And so my question would be, um, what role do you see for think tanks in particular in the civil society ecosystem? Well, first of all, let me just say how thrilled I am to be back here for EPC's 25th birthday. I just did some quick math in my head, and it's now been 17 years since I was an EPC management board member. And I can hear Jackie Davis giggling because um, it makes both of us either young or ages us, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but it is really a thrill to be back in this community um, that meant so much to me back then and uh, created such uh, a rich um, floor of opportunities for me. And that's why I'm very glad to see you here, Sophie, because I know that you, all the policy analysts in the EPC are going to go on to do wonderful things for this world. So again, thank you for having me back for this alumni gathering. Um, you know, I think think tanks uh, and their role um, in this particular society, in the European context, has really changed and evolved. And you mentioned Bertelsmann. Bertelsmann has done with the EPC over the last couple of years really interesting uh, deep dive studies on uh, citizen participation, what works, what doesn't work. And I think the main conclusion that we came to is that, you know, we're at a really interesting moment. You heard from Ivan Krastev earlier today, uh, you know, where everywhere by every metric, we're seeing a decline in democracy. And yet in the midst of this perma crisis, as, uh, as you have coined the phrase, um, you know, and I would argue a little bit with Emily in the sense that what is the EU for? Is it for protection or is it to create resilience among its citizens? And what you're seeing is that different groups of citizens, I work a lot on the role of cities in international relations, 
where they find and negotiate their own power and can create endemic linkages that bind them together and address these issues in a functional way vis-a-vis -vis the sort of more paternalistic, the seven ways within uh, the EU construct that we have to bring civic society to the civil society to the table. We're seeing now that people are wanting to organize. They need a voice. They want to become more resilient and they don't necessarily know how. So it's a great opportunity for organizations like think tanks um, or think do tanks quote unquote, to build those bridges. And uh, when I was the director of the of the German Council on Foreign Relations, the main thing that we, and we were on the cusp of the German uh, federal election, the idea was that we needed to go out and engage people around the role that Germany needed to play in the world. And that was clearly before uh, the war in Ukraine. And again, not so much, quote unquote, to tell them how to think about the world, but to engage truly in a different set of conversations. Um, and, you know, I was uh, grateful to be part of the high-level uh, gr group that looked at the outcome of the citizen dialogue uh, for the Conference on the Future of Europe. And what you saw was an incredible amount of energy in that room, an incredible amount of desire to engage with expertise, to understand how expertise affected choice, right? Because what we're talking about is empowering citizens to make better choices, to navigate uh, this idea of overlapping simultaneous moments of choice. Um, and as much as you can do that in an effective and create that kind of space, people are perfectly willing to engage, regardless of the numbers that you see with respect to backsliding of democracy. Part of the reason you mentioned Fridays for Future, part of the reason you see people in the street with that kind of energy or, you know, uh, gluing themselves to uh, strategic infrastructure um, is because they're almost desperate for some kind of a bridge function. And I do think that think tanks, that different kind of, you, you know, union in some um, uh, countries are really having a, a comeback, including in the United States, where two years ago you would have said unions are completely dead. So different ways of finding, um, you know, giving personal choice on citizen engagement is, I think, where it's at. And think tanks need to be in this role where they are providing both identifying the moments of political power that can help civic engagement find ways of political power and engaging around power, we would not have the EU anti-discrimination uh, legislation and directive if it weren't for that kind of rallying of civic society organizations. And then a think tank of sorts, uh, you know, to identify a moment to launch this legislation. So in a lot of di various different areas, even throughout the history of the EU, that's the role the think tanks, now do tanks, or those kind of society actors have played in identifying where the power needs to live, mobilizing that, and then linking it to the political power opportunity that exists. And I think it's important, even in this discussion, to do exactly what the theme of your conference is, which is to talk about power because there's power in numbers, there's power in organization, there's power in advocacy, and increasingly that is being better matched when those organizations understand just how much power they have, including people like uh, mayors, including people like cities, vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, as sort of a political system widely spoken that's in disarray. Thank you. I would have a lot to say, and I, I think it's extremely interesting to see also how civil society has changed, how you know it evolves, and maybe also the question of what kind of power do they exercise? Is it does politics exercise power over civil society, or do they see it more as power to and power with? But to come to you now, Daniel, um, you're managing director of Transparency International. Um, I mean, one of the I would say most famous NGOs. So my question would be similar to those um, I asked Emily O'Reilly. In what way? Do you see the role of civil society nowadays, especially in Europe, um, knowing the kind of difficulties that we face in political and economic terms? Thanks, Sophie. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, to begin with, um, uh, congratulations to EPC for the, on the 25-year uh, anniversary. And, and thanks uh, to, to Fabian for uh, in the invite, but also for being on our board for our EU office here in, um, in Brussels. And um, I would said that because I was just going to say that we're turning 30 as an NGO, and uh, we're going to celebrate that over the course of next year. But there is a bit of a sad statistic in that as well, that over the last two, three years of our existence, of our 30-year existence, we have seen more issues, and I'm approaching this topic from a global level, uh, in our uh, about 100 chapters and an additional 20 
country offices of, of one sort or another, so 120 countries around the world. We have had more issues over the last two, three years with civic space than we had in our whole history. And when I say issues, I mean evacuations, I mean um, uh, slap lawsuits, I mean burglary with suspicious uh, origins and purpose. I mean harassment that is very clear focused on shutting us down as an organization. And we're, we're talking 15 odd countries where we're dealing with this on a frequent basis. Over the last two, three years, this has cropped up. And what we are seeing, what I'm seeing from my perspective is that it's accelerating. To answer your question, Sophie, in that context, clearly we are having power because we wouldn't see foreign states investing money and in trying to hack our IT infrastructure big money if they didn't see a reason to do so. So certainly we, we have a role to play in, in uh, politics and that's the, the purpose in our case to ensure transparency and fighting corruption wherever it may rise. But at the same time, our role as defending democracy as civil society is, is not that well understood in even in the EU where we're having problems here as well. Of course, there are some countries, I don't need to mention any, where we have civic space issues, but also on a, on a grander level. One example is the European Court of Justice decision last week to decide that civil society should not have access to what is called beneficial ownership registers. So what is that? That's registers over who owns which corporations. These registers, which we have been campaigning hard to make available, to create them and to make them available for the public and civil society, are crucial in our efforts to do investigations of corrupt wrongdoing and to see how regulations are, are working. And one good example in this is, is our support to authorities in implementing the sanctions following Russia's inv invasion. But already before that, we un uncovered together with partners a case on, on Babich, and there's numerous cases that we as civil society have achieved thanks to our involvement in, in uh, using these information sources that we no longer will have access to. That to me shows a degree of naivety or unawareness amongst the political players of the critical role the civil society plays. I mean, we, we are in many other spaces as well. We have what's called the integrity pacts, not only in the EU, but across the world where in public, large public procurement projects, we have insight in the, the procurement processes to ensure that there's trust in the public in the decisions that are being made. And, and that comes back to the topic now with the, the rise of misinformation, populism and distrust in institutions, the role of civil society is more important than ever because as much as we are a party of, of all the stakeholders, we are something that is outside of the, the administration that we, we're reviewing and our insight and our reviews gives added trust, which we all need in order to defend democracy at this moment in time. Thank you. And because this panel is very quick, um, I have multiple questions, but I only ask one. Uh, and then we'll open up also for questions uh, to make sure that we're in time for the Timmermans keynote. Um, and my question, because after all, we are in Brussels, we are uh, close to the EU institutions, um, and you mentioned that the role of civil society is more important than ever. At the same time, you mentioned also the ECJ judgment saying that it doesn't support the work of civil society. So my question, and it, I would start with you, uh, Mrs. Uh, O'Reilly, is how can the EU ensure that it supports civil society in the future? You could say, of course, stopping... Uh, <laughs> having decisions by the court of justice but maybe also looking at the other institutions how to make sure that it has the power uh, that it should have well it's interesting that 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 judgment i haven't read it yet but yes the headlines are pretty stark all right and it my understanding of it is that there is a very high value given to data protection issues uh, and we're constantly coming across that in, in our work where data protection is being used as a shield against transparency I think data protection for all sorts of reasons, some very valid reasons, is, is having a moment, whereas transparency, access to documents had its moment in the late 1990s and the early part of this century. So it, it's something 
that that certainly needs to be uh, that certainly needs to be worked. By the way, I don't I don't think there's a, tr a contradiction between uh, protecting citizens and making them resilient. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you you protect your children by making them resilient, you know. Uh, and I think, you know, a lot of the protection of of Ukrainian citizens is being done by other countries sending weapons and other um, uh, other material in order to help them to make resilience. So I don't think there's there's a contradiction between the two. But I think civil society has to be seen, and that's the most important. And it has to be given the same ranking as other sectors. Um, and a lot of the work that we've done, for example, the EU civil service, a lot of people describe it as big and bloated. In fact, the EU civil service is tiny in comparison to the civil service of of, uh, of member states, the commission I think is 30,000 people, so it needs to draw on a lot of expertise when it's uh, proposing regulation and so on. So it has a lot of, I think something like 800 expert groups. Um, and I, work that we've done has been to make sure that the expertise is balanced as between all interests, uh, civil society interests and, and, uh, and more private sector interests. And, and we've just, um, finished a piece of work on the cap reforms, the agricultural reforms, and we were looking at the extent to which um, civil society actors, environmental NGOs and so on were listened to and not just the uh, agricultural interests. So it's very important. It's very important that civil society has a place at the table and as big a place. There's very often a very practical term, civil society can't afford to be at the table. You know, private interests have the money to get lobbyists to be there to, you know, work 24 seven to find out what's going on and to seek to influence it, which is entirely legitimate. But civil society operators and actors very often, you know, don't have that. And, and that, is, um, that is extremely important. So they need to be heard. And they also don't need to be patronized either. Uh, I mean, as the EU occasionally comes up with what are called citizen facing initiatives, um, you know, the uh, European citizens initiative, uh, whereby, uh, you know, a million signatures or whatever the number is. And, and if you get so many signatures from seven different member states, then your initiative will be maybe developed into a regulation that has been sluggish to say the least. Um, the European, uh, not the convention, what was it? The the, uh, yeah, the Conference on the Future of Europe. Yeah, again, huge energy. I attended a few of those, those sessions and so on. And I remember the final session in Strasbourg when the leaders of the three um, big institutions, the Parliament, the Commission and the Council, and indeed President uh, Macron, whose idea it was, I think, so he says, um, stood and, and lauded all of the work. But it'll be interesting to see uh, what happens then. So, you know, a lot of these initiatives, they sound good, they look good, but are they are they hollow? And of course, civil society has a role to play in making sure they become real. But for the moment, it's the administration and uh, governments who, who hold the levers. So what they need to do is share those levers a little bit more with civil society and make sure they have a genuine and real place at the table. Thank you. I'll just give the same question to you. Look, I mean, I think Emily is formulated this nicely. I would have said said listen and create avenues of for accountability because as you've just mapped out where the whole thing comes apart, where, you know, if you have these paternalistic structures and multilateral structures aren't immune. I mean, the same thing happens within the UN. You know, if you look at again how through the Habitat program cities were included, you know, and and if you look at the sustainable development goals, you know, the fact that cities are goal number 11 when if you don't have have sustainable cities you have nothing else right i mean this is this sort of paternalism that after a while you know david allen called it brusselization that emanates when multilateral structures are at work at that level and yet you know if you don't have a listening component and an accountability component then you know the entire power structure and i think emily pointed that out so nicely where does the power emanate from and where should control lie and rest and if that's if you if you have a power mismatch people will go elsewhere and quote unquote the elsewhere is you know we find in Timothy Garton Ash's Oxford project you know that you have 30 percent of our young people who think authoritarian regimes 
you know, are worthy to be looked at, not because they believe in the ideology, mm -hmm. but because they seemingly provide the efficacy, the direction. Now, you know, all of all of that is shifting rapidly, of course, through Ukraine, but what is happening in Iran, what is happening in China, which is to say rights will out, right? Which is to say right. there is sort of an innate idea that individualism, freedom of choice, freedom of voice, freedom of, of, of expression are vital to the human condition. And yet, you know, those numbers are what they are. And then conversely, you know, on the positive end, again, if you look at how mayors have organized themselves, you know, if you take the Visegrad Four, if you take, you know, the kind of where, you know, if you if you look at where you have the greatest amount of backsliding in the European community right now, if you look at uh, Hungary, if you look at Poland, you know, where has the countervailing force been? It's been in the centers of democracy where it still lives, which is in the cities. You now have the mayors lobbying not only through the organization that, you you know, paternalistically, the EU has built for itself, namely um, um, the Committee of the Regions, but you you have them going directly to the commission. You have them, you know, seeking audience with the commission president, who, because of, you know, our very basic ideas of subsidiarity, is reluctant to take those meetings, but also begins to understand that these people are key to solving a problem that she has with respect to accountability, transparency, functional issues of democracy that undergird the world's greatest peace project, which is the European Union. So, which is to say that if you're not, going to let that level create structures that work for uh, that kind of engagement of civic society, they will find those structures themselves. Because as you rightly mentioned in your introduction, the problems are too rife and the speed is too high. You can no longer solve problems in a linearity, you know, problem by problem in the way that you may have done, you know, in the early days of the commission when you were setting up major pockets of issues where you're going to uh, integrate specific problem areas. Everything is happening at the same time. And if you don't, quote unquote, pass that responsibility on in a functional way um, and you renegotiate power, literally you are going to get nowhere. You're going to get stasis, you're going to get disillusionment, and you're going to perpetuate what we see. Idea just put out their, their assessment of, of European and global democracy. It is horrific. And you're going to continue to see that if you don't understand that we need, you know, new forms of social contracts, new forms of social consensus, new forms of listening, engaging with one another, but quote unquote, from the other direction. Thanks for that strong criticism of the status quo, I guess. Um, Daniel Eriksson, the same question to you, especially as Transparency International has a Brussels office as well. Um, what, how do you see the EU supporting civil society more in the future? How do you wish to see it supported more? To begin with, I was here actually, I was I came yesterday because we had a closing uh, ceremony of a project that was EU funded by FISMA, uh, which was focused on uh, our work across the member states to, uh, to uh, strengthen the beneficial ownership transparency registers, which we no longer have access to. Uh, but we respect, by the way, the, obviously the, the European Court uh, of Justice decision. Um, but that was an example of a really good project that has been going over the course of a year. Uh, bringing a lot of our chapters here here together. And I, I really hope that it was just a start of the kind of collaboration and support that we can have from, from the EU. Uh, there's many other uh, elements that I think needs reinforcement. The work globally that we're conducting from our perspective, once again, 120 countries. Uh, sure, the defense of democracy at home in in Europe is is really uh, really important, but we need we need to look at the um, frail and budding democracies around the world and ensure that civil society is strengthened and defended in in those places as well. And I I would like to see greater support from the EU institutions uh, in those areas. Um, I would like to see in general, obviously, greater transparency in into the processes uh, of all institutions, not only as a concept, but to, to open up for new ways of civil society to work. For us, like I said, in terms of procurement as one example, but also in, in the climate question, uh, in the questions on, on technology, uh, another one that where we're working at, uh, for us to, to contribute more actively in, in uh, both in terms of how technology could be regulated in order to reduce the likelihood of, of corruption, 
but also how, most importantly for us, how corruption could be used in order to further the, the, the cause of civil society, to strengthen civil society, and obviously in our case, to, uh, uh, to chase down the corrupt in, in line of our mantra, uh, to ensure that the corrupt have nothing to steal, nobody to help, and, and uh, nowhere to hide. Um, so th yeah, just to, to sum up, we are receiving support. We certainly could re receive more, and we would like to see civil society being seen as a more serious actor. I feel that every time I mention to somebody the things that we do, everyone knows us for the CPI, which is coming out in January, by the way, that is like 2%. It's a very important piece of work that we do, but it's 2% of our overall effort that we're putting around in, in globally. The rest is our direct efforts to, to uncover corruption and strengthen legislation across the world. And we can do more of that in Europe as well. Thank you. Thank you also for mentioning the, the CPI and also the corruption work you do. Um, and we're all waiting, or at least I am, uh, for the decision of the council when it comes to Hungary um, beginning of December. I'm looking at the watch and I would say there's time for one round of questions. And yes, great. There is Jackie. I'll take three questions uh, and give them back to the to the panel. And I don't I don't see anyone. Yes, way you've back got one. here. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, thank you very much. Turn on Kopfer. Um, the question maybe to Daniel and about the, the, the way how transparency works actually with businesses. If I remember correctly, you also have programs to advise companies how to improve their own internal processes to reduce corruption and maybe also install whistleblowing hotlines and so on. How do you see business as an ally here in this respect and uh, what could they do more? Thank you very much. Thank you. Any more? While I'm here? No? Looks like it, Sophie. Back to you. Okay. Well, in that case, the question of how can businesses be allies? I don't know. You seem to want yeah, to answer. Yeah, no, I'm ready because uh, business is an important ally for us. And both on, on national levels, many of our chapters have set up business for us, dozens of chapters where they work with national uh, businesses in order to strengthen their resilience towards corruption at home and abroad on a global level. We have programs where we work with business. Business is is a strong ally in our cause because they struggle with corruption, particularly in terms of, of exports and establishing abroad. And they want to get over this. Business wants certainty and good competition. They, want, they don't want to be reliant on taking uh, risky decisions that gets into the great territory of, of corruption. Hence, uh, their work with us on, on those topics, whistleblowing is, is another one to ensure that we have good whistleblowing uh, standards that can be adopted by business. Uh, so uh, in, in general, a strong ally, but we also in that area see that we need to do more. And, and one concern that we have are the really big corporations that are getting uh, a lot of power. Uh, I'm not saying that th that is wrong, but we need to work closer with them, the Microsoft, the Meta, uh, the Apples of the world, in order to sure, ensure that the work that they do, which have impact on corruption, on civic space, also is, is mindful uh, of, of um, the consequences of the decisions that they take. Can I just say something positive about, because we've been knocking on the uh, European civic engagement space now uh, from this stage uh, in a way. Look, I think, you know, what we did way back in the day with the chemicals um, directive, the idea that you would do impact assessments and you would make them multi-stakeholder and you would plan in time for those kind of multi-stakeholder initiatives. Um, we spoke a little bit about technology, this idea that now you could do multi-stakeholder engagement or track two type three negotiations on major pieces of legislation with much more consequence and across all EU member states in a you know in a in a in a multi-layer environment if you structured that purposely I think ultimately will make uh, again would get us in a position where um, you're doing risk assessments early but you're also doing sort of action assessments early uh, and you're you know as as I spent 12 years at the Kennedy School and the way that we teach leadership there is to give the work back to the people at a pace they can handle which is to say identify, you know, this is a modern version of subsidiarity, which is to say, identify where the different levers and layers of work are in this. And you can 
do a lot of that increasingly, that kind of track two or, or risk assessment work early uh, using a whole host and series of technological tools, um, which I, you know, I frankly hope and wish uh, were engaged with more, um, more honestly. I spent a lot of time, um, having just flown in from Germany, spending a lot of time uh, with German industry right now, whether it's the machine builders uh, or um, you know various service providers, because they're all asking themselves the biggest questions, and they are frankly, along with cities, uh, among the front lines of addressing a number of these problems, whether it's decoupling, whether it's climate change, whether it's um, dealing with the consequences of, of, of social fissure, uh, they're all at, this, at the front lines, uh, you know, whether it's changing workflows, uh, changing employees, et cetera, et cetera. They're at the front lines and engaging with them early and finding different ways to do it creates ultimately better decision making um, and better legislation. If you want to say something, and maybe also to the um, how the EU institutions handle businesses compared to civil society and whether you see a difference there? Because you mentioned before that maybe civil society doesn't have the same power as business. Well, yeah, for the reasons I mentioned before, obviously the business does tend to get perhaps a, a, a bigger uh, a hearing uh, despite uh, obviously the, the commission obviously making and others making efforts to include civil society as well, but by, you know, by dint of their, their capacity, their size, their resources and so on, they can they can they can make their way to the table and have a stronger voice by by dint of that. But just reflecting on 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 what the other speakers have been saying in the questions, I mean, the word resilience, we talked about it in terms of citizens being resilient, but actually administrations have to be resilient as well. And I know a topic that's that's coming up more frequently in, in academia, uh, research and among the ombudsman community as well is the role of artificial intelligence in public administration. Um, and I, I think um, that, that that is something that really needs to be looked at. And I think the EU obviously has done a lot of work in relation to you know, uh, attempting to, to regulate the global tech world because they see the control that they can exert greater than state control, that big administrative uh, control over all aspects of our lives. And increasingly, I, I see this issue of artificial intelligence and how it might be used uh, becoming a, a topic, not just at uh, on the margins, but a little bit at, at the water cooler as well. And I think that the real challenge for administrations is to get ahead of the, the digital, the technological curve, or at least to keep pace with it. Uh, because if it doesn't, then we're going to end up with some of the messes we've already seen uh, with with uh, the what's happened in relation to digital uh, technological advance in, in particular. So resilient civil society, certainly, but also resilient and cop down administrations. Thank you. And I already see that Mr. Timmermans is sitting there. So what I'd like to do is have like one last round of a question, which is maybe a bit more looking forward, um, because most of the subjects we tend to discuss tend to be quite pessimistic or it's not very you know funny and flowery but what I would like to ask you because also the topic of this entire jubilee conference was the EU's power and I'll start with you Daniel is like what kind of power would you like civil society to see in the future in Europe and if you can maybe make it more concrete and like how what would be your wishful thinking vision of civil society in Europe I would like to see civil society recognized as a pillar in the defense against autocracy. That what one of the things that puts us as a democracy as, uh, aside from autocracies is a vibrant civil society, which we invite into the inner rooms of policymaking. It's a very easy one and it's realistic. So I can just stop there. Thank you. Well, for me, when I have a bad day, um, that's part of the reason I work on urban diplomacy and on cities. I think, you know, cities remain the vital beating heart of our democracies. I think it's fruitless to reinvent something that cities are already providing, which is a space in which to en engage in an inclusive way. Uh, they've created formats from them for themselves, from participatory budgeting to direct decision making to using some technological tools to expand the frame of City Hall to engage citizens far beyond uh, where 
they are. They provide direct services. And that we see this in every survey that that's still where trust resides. 72% of Americans think that cities are where uh, they're going to make the end of sort of polemicized politics end. Uh, and so, you know, if you build from there uh, and if you give mayors a greater function and it's in the German coalition agreement, it's in a number of different places, this idea that urban diplomacy, figuring out um, how cities who, you know, are frankly part of the biggest 100 economic entities in the world uh, competing with Walmart and the, the state of California, quote unquote, um, you know, they are an economic engine. They are a creative engine. They are an inclusive engine. They're the way places where the franchise in terms of voting still expands. They're the ways and where we work out our conflicts and our differences. Uh, so giving cities first and foremost, a, a more active, um, responsible role at the table uh, and not, 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 you know, needing to reinvent the wheel, I think would be a good measurable accountable way uh, to move things forward. Thank you. Well, I, I think we've seen how quickly civil society can become uncivil society if civil society isn't uh, really uh, brought in as a as a real and concrete partner to government and 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 to administration. I mean, I mentioned at the beginning uh, of the the case we just finished in relation to the commission's refusal to release documents in relation to the uh, negotiations about the recovery funds of uh, of Sweden and and Denmark. Though Sweden and Denmark ultimately didn't have a problem uh, releasing them. We're now dealing with other cases involving other countries, and it just strikes me as that's a perfect example where. You know, the Commission, the administration could see citizens as a partner. It's their money and it's been spent in their countries and it's been spent specifically with a view to making those countries more resilient uh, post uh, post COVID. So, you know, we, we have to look at, uh, you know, the administration sort of, and I know all the reasons why it might not do this, but they just have to, to trust civil society a, a little bit more. Um, and engage with them a little bit more because I think um, if they don't, as we've seen in America, that you know civil society can become uncivil, um, and that is something that we have to really guard against. These last few years have shown us how fragile our democracies can be. Some of them just hang by a thread. These things can change, you know, um, at the turn of a coin. Um, so even the small things need to be considered. Um, and I think that in the EU administration, which I said, and I said even before Commissioner Timmermans came into the room, does do a lot of very good things. I think they just need to trust civil society a little bit more. Thank you. I think that was a perfect final word because after all, democracy is about, you know, representing the interests of citizens. And even if the EU is a bit further away from the citizens, because there's a lot of them in 27 member states, they still play quite an important role. Thank you so much for taking the time for this short but sweet panel, I would say. Um, thank you also for listening. I know you had a long day and I will hand over to Jackie who has been wonderfully going through this entire day for the final keynote. Thank you and a round of applause for Sophie and her wonderful panel. Thank you very much indeed.